for this weekend of worship was regeneration. So if you've noticed on any of the posters or the shirt that Max is wearing, there's some tree rings on it, which is signifying like the changes we all go through with our walk with God. And we've been blessed to have Pastor Josh with us um, preaching about it. So Josh, do you want to come up the front? Okay, so we have a few questions for Josh. First of all, yes. <laughs> First of all, how long have you known Pastor Josh over here? Never seen him in my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've known Josh, I think I was just reflecting now, I think since about maybe 2009. Uh, our French freshman year, my dad was teaching me drums, um, but I actually didn't learn a lot, so it's just more of a question of me, not other. Lovely. So, uh, Okay, so second question, what's your favourite season? My favourite season? I think I'm just going to have to go with summer. Uh, I'm a big fan of warm weather, so winter, which is a killer, especially being in Melbourne. I have to agree with that. Um, last of all, when was a time God answered your prayer? Oh, man, all the time. But one that's been really recent and on my heart is this lady that we've been serving. We run a natural program here in one of my churches. And we've been praying for this lady... Um, COVID, they ran this, this pizza shop and it actually went under. They had to declare bankruptcy and she literally couldn't, couldn't feed her family. And so we were, uh, we've been delivering food to her, we've been praying with her. And, and she herself, she's like, I don't believe in God, but we've been praying for miracles. And, and recently, um, a lady came up to her from, from the school and just said, I got $200 on the weekend for my birthday. And I prayed about it because I really didn't need it. And, and we were praying for her and the school's praying for her. And, and this lady just came and then handed this, this family... 200 bucks just said God said I need to give it to you and um, it just blessed her life and it's changed her and she's starting to believe okay maybe maybe there is a God maybe there's a God who, who wants to help me um, and it's been cool just to see the, the growth and development and the eyes open in, in her life so yeah that's really work. cool thank you for that that's all, all the questions all right um, we've also got some announcements so tonight at 5 p.m. we've got a games night in the hall um, please bring $5 for pizza. Um, tomorrow from 9am we have the Pathfinder Bunnings Barbecue. So if you could come, buy a sausage sanger. Um, all the funding is taking our club to the big AUC Camporee next year. So it'd be really great if you can help us get there. Um, and don't forget we've got our last weekend of worship program at 6.30 on Sunday night. Okay, now it's time for an icebreaker. So I need you all to stand up, please. So to match the theme, we're going to do a bit of a trivia to do with generations. So basically, I'm going to ask a question. And for the first option, if you think that's the correct one, you have to put your hands on your head. And if you think it's the second one, you have to put your hands on your hips. And if you get it right, you can remain standing. If you get it wrong, you have to sit down and you're eliminated. <laughs> okay, so question one. When did the first iPad come out? If you think it was in 2010, put your hands on your head. If you think it's 2008, put your hands on your hips. Everyone got your answers? Okay, the correct answer is 2010. So if you have your hands on your head, you can keep standing. All right, our second question is, when did the first colour TV become available in Australia? So if you think it was 1974, put your hands on your head. If you think it was 1962, put your hands on your hips. Okay. Awesome. So if you have your hands on your head, you are correct. All right, next question. What year was TikTok launched? So if you think it was 2019, put your hands on your head. If you think it was 2016, put your hands on your hips. When, when, TikTok, when it became TikTok. So 2019 is hands on your heads or 2016? 
Okay, the correct answer was 2016. Wait. Okay, so our next question is, when was MySpace shut down? So if you think it was 2009, put your hands on your head. If you think it was 2012, put your hands on your hips. All right, if you've got your hands on your head, you're correct. Last but not least, this is to determine who the winners are. When did the first disposable camera come out in Australia? Put your hands on your head if you think it's 1975 and on your hips if you think it's 1986. Okay, the correct answer is 1986, so if you have your hands on your hips. Thank you for participating. For everyone who got the answers right, you can come see us after church and we'll have a prize for you. Thank you. It's been such an awesome start to our weekend. We started our weekend early on Thursday um, and we've yeah been running these programs Thursday night and last night and as the girls mentioned, we're finishing tomorrow night. Um, and I just want to say thank you to the whole church for supporting us. Um, there's a bunch of you that lent me some old items, um, which you may have seen in the video at the beginning. Um, and yeah, just in all kinds of different ways that you guys have been supporting us, driving your kids here every night, um, helping down in the kitchen and all kinds of things. Um, but I just wanted to, yeah, share our gratitude to our church that we get to do this as a youth. We haven't done this in, I think, at least three years. I can't remember when the last one was. So it's really special for our young people to have this chance to have a week of worship. Um, and it's, you know, we get to do it at school every year, but um, here, everyone wants to be here. They're not forced to. So it's a really nice environment. Um, to worship together and I had a bit of a moment on Sunday night when a bunch of these guys were setting up they have so many of our young people have put so many hours into this week of their own time and I remember just looking up and you know we had all the lights turned on and everything and I thought wow how many churches in Australia would actually let us get away with this just taking over the church and doing whatever we want <laughs> Um, but it's just like a feeling of like complete gratitude and you know we're so blessed to be in a church that supports and encourages our young people um, and you know we're reminded that of every baptism we have and we do the vows and say that you know we're going to support our young people and you know this is the result of it is these weeks like this and yeah I'm really grateful to all our church for that so thank you so much. Jess can you help us celebrate someone's birthday? It so, was Kyle's yesterday. Kyle's yesterday. I have some chocolate. So uh, first of all, can we switch to the screen? Let's see whose birthday it is. Brett's tomorrow. No, it's just Brett's. Ariana Grande's. There we go. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. Oh, it's just... It's, oh, no. I don't know why that's, it's doing that, enough. but I have a slideshow. Uh, with. Here we go. Oh, it's just rushing through things. <laughs> Carolyn Sheriff is so lucky she's not here today. I love you! I love you. <laughs> so I do have some photos, but I don't know why it's not working. That's right, we got the idea. But uh, <laughs> the iPad that was invented in 2010 has gone a bit funny on us. Um, but I, yeah, it's not working. It is on that screen, but not on this one. Okay, well anyway, Jess, we wanted to wish you a happy birthday. We have some flowers Aww. for you and a gift from Mrs. Lillo. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so here we go. Here's the photos. Let's have a look. Wow, wow you found that. Oh, now it's gone again. <laughs> My goodness. No, it's not going to work. Oh, here we go. Okay, let's hope it works. Here's one. Baptised by Pastor Bob Bolst in 1963. 
<laughs> Who was in the font there with you? That's my sister. Your sister, okay. Oh, yeah, hold uh, the chocolates. Yeah. Don't eat them. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, let's look at the next one. Who's that guy with you? Why the face? He forced me to preach when I said I wouldn't. <laughs> okay. Uh, here's another one. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> I think that's when we were voting the girls into membership that you studied with. Uh, she always has a face that she's pulling. Is that right, Mum? Where's Julie? Somewhere here. Up the back there. Yep. Okay. That's you with oh, your sister. Love yeah. that How old were you there? Um, I don't remember. I found my baptismal certificate the other day, actually, but I don't remember. <laughs> Who's the guy next to you there? He's taken, sorry. He's taken. <laughs> I, I'm not interested. Okay. Keep babies away from Jess. That's you and? Ruth. Ruth, yeah. Okay. That's with Pastor Ron oh, Sydney. Yeah, yeah, Nick. I think he was saying something about you finding a boyfriend soon, wasn't he then? Probably. He said it so many times Probably. during that week. <laughs> we didn't know you played. Who'd like a special item next week? <laughs> that one's thanks to Carolyn every year. Every year. <laughs> That's you and your late father, hey? Oh, good. Close up. <laughs> We're running out of photos. I think we're coming to the end. And there's the last one. So, happy birthday. There is so much love from our church family to you. You mean the world to everyone here. You work so hard and you're always appreciated, yeah? Thank you. Jess runs on empty often because she not only has a few jobs but also studies theology at Avondale and at the end of the year it all finishes, right? And you can have a normal life. <laughs> so... Let's have a prayer for Jess, yeah? And for everyone else that's having a birthday in June. Father in heaven, we are so grateful because you are a loving God and you give us much more than we ever deserve in life. We thank you for Jess and her ministry here at Castle Hill. It's invaluable to the life of our church, to the life of our young people. Thank you for her absolute commitment to the gospel message, for her integrity, Lord. Thank you for just been a person who keeps her word when she says she's going to do something she follows through and at the moment lord there's a lot of emotion coming from jess lord and i just pray that you continually bless her that you anoint her with your holy spirit and may wherever she goes may she be a walking best friend of jesus we ask in jesus name amen happy birthday Okay, um, just a few other things. We have a couple to vote into membership today, and that's Lewis and Maria Kispe. Do you want to come up the front? You can get one of my special chocolates, okay? Say, uh, so um, Lewis and Maria have been attending Castle Hill now for how many years? Years upon years. Years upon <laughs> many years. Uh, Since the kids were in um, Josh started year five. Yeah. Okay, so it's been a few years. It's taken them a while to get their membership here. Um, for those who don't know Lewis, he's involved in Pathfinder. He's an engineer. And Maria is a, sorry, a physiotherapist who recently got a master's degree and is able to do more, right? Yes? And earn more. Um, so uh, who would like to propose that we accept them into membership, a seconder? All in favour? Thank you so much. things that I need to uh, announce. The men's barbecue that's listed for tomorrow has been postponed because of the Pathfinder barbecue happening at uh, Bunnings store at Castle Hill. And if you would like to donate to the Pathfinder barbecue that's happening, you can order a virtual hot dog, 
um, online by going to your bulletin and finding it there. There's a uh, QR code. A virtual one means that however many are paid for, Richard Rudenko will eat them gladly for you, okay? Um, okay, so our offering today is for the Hurstfield School, so I invite the deacons to come forward. And uh, yeah, so let's give generously to Hurstfield School. It's a growing school. Um, and uh, it's a school that really needs our support, as does Adventist education. Let's pray for the offering. Father, thank you that we can give back to you. And may this offering that goes to Hurstville School bless the school, all the teachers, the students, and all the dreams and aspirations that they have. May the funds help them with, a, with scholarships that they want to offer students and families. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, as we're doing that, can the kids come down for a kid's story up the front? Thank you. Okay, hello, we have some other kids I know. Hey guys, how are you? Okay, so I want to tell you a story and then I have something to give you at the end which you may be able to see already. There once was a boy who planted a tree. Has anyone planted a tree or a plant before? You have Dylan? Yeah, you have? Oh, three trees, wow. Wow. Wow, well, in this story, there was one boy who planted a tree. He made sure to dig a nice, deep hole for the roots at the bottom and in a space that got lots of sunlight so it could grow well. It started off really small and was only up to his knees when it started. Every day when he came home from school, he would go outside and have a look at the tree. Every now and then he would water it, he would fertilise the soil and he was so proud of his tree that he would rub clean every single leaf. He got used to counting how many leaves were on the tree. After a while, he noticed a new leaf. <gasps> what an exciting day that was. Over many years, the tree grew up in the boy's backyard. When he left school, he was very tall, but the tree had grown taller than him. The leaves had gave good shade in the summer, and the trunk was so big that he could barely wrap his arms around it. Every time he looked at the tree, the boy remembered all the things that happened under that tree. He played many games, read books, reading, hanging from a hammock, camped beneath the stars by the tree, and even climbed the tree to see over the fence. What a story that tree told. Now, I've got a little cross section of a tree here. Can you all see that? This is my, that's what the inside of a tree looks like. Can you see all the circles? And this has been on our logo for our Youth Week of Worship, all these circles everywhere. Because if you look at these rings, these rings tell us how old a tree is and what the weather was like during that year. So the light-coloured rings represent wood that grew in spring and summer. And the dark rings, can you see the darker rings there, represent wood that grew in the late summer and, and autumn. So the patterns of the wide and narrow rings all over this tree show us how it changes. Can you see how it kind of changed shape every year? It looks slightly different, didn't it? 
but it kept growing bigger and bigger every single year. And I think you can pass that around if you like to have a look at it. I think our faith is kind of like the rings of a tree because we learn more about Jesus every year. And our understanding of our faith becomes a little bit more complicated. But like the tree, we don't actually change who we are. Our faith doesn't change and our God doesn't change. We just grow upon what we had before. The earlier rings don't go away. We just add to them. And just like the tree is affected by the seasons and the weather around it, our faith grows as in response to the experiences we have in the world. So there are many things that the rings of a tree can teach us. They can teach us that we change as we grow. Do you think you've changed since you were younger? Yeah, we change a little bit as we grow. There you go. But we're always the same person still. And we always have the same God. And we grow at our best when the environment around us is good. And as we grow, we develop a story of our past journey, which we can share with others around us. And this is what I want to give you guys today. We're going to write our stories on the tree rings here. And I've started one for you. We're all going to write, what have you learnt about Jesus? You can draw pictures inside the rings or you can write a sentence. Thank you, Lacey. And I'm going to give you some colouring in pencils and this you can take to your chairs and you can write things that you've learnt about Jesus in every single ring so we can see the story that you have already. Thank you so much, kids. You can take one and then go and sit down with this. Well, thanks for that lovely children's story, Jess. Um, We're going to get back into some praise and worship. It's going to be a new song called um, Freedom is Coming. And it kind of just talks about how Jesus came and he sacrificed himself so that we could have freedom, that we could have life, um, despite everything that we've done. So I invite you all to sing with us and stand as we sing.
standing as we sing Honey in the Rock. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, manna on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need you got. There's honey in the rock. Praying for a miracle, thirsty.
Jesus, thank you for loving us always, for blessing us and being with us in all that we do in our busy lives. Thank you for all the newborns in the church, Mr. Groves and his wife's baby, Lexi, Martin and Gurley's daughter, Riley, and Sappho and Kendra's daughter, Anea. Please be with all those who are sick, whether they are at home or in hospital, and please bring them healing. Please be with Tracy's parents as they are not well. Thank you for all our youth and for the youth weekend of worship. Please help us to draw closer to you and to love you more and more. Please be with all our elderly people at Castle Hill. Please keep them strong and healthy and thank you for the amazing people that they are. Please be with Pastor Josh Stadnick today as he preaches. Bless his word and help it to touch all our hearts. Thank you for all that you do for us, God, and for your unfailing love. In your holy and precious name, amen. guys here today. Uh, my name is Josh. Yes, another Pastor Josh at your church. Uh, it's been great the, the past couple of days exploring this theme of regeneration. And the idea behind that is, is following in the same God in a different world. Because each and every one of us need to, to learn to follow God in the context we find ourselves in. And, and the first night we really explored what it means to, to read the Bible and learn the Bible for ourselves. And you might see there are some QR codes in your seats, and you might be wondering, what are those QR codes? And that's actually a little guide that I, I put together on actually reading the Bible. And so if you like it or if you want to share it with someone, I have these, these little QR codes as well that you can come grab with me and, and share it with people because the Bible is an amazing book that we need to keep exploring and keep finding meaningful truth in. And, and last night, last night was a bit of fun. I did a... Um, bit of a master chef demonstration up here, and we learned that we need to be able to feed ourselves so that we can teach others and we can continue to grow in our faith. And today we're going to have some more fun as well, and I've got this, this question up on the screen. Does anyone here like math? Who's a math person? We've got, we got a couple, so they're, they're hesitant to stay, to say if they like math. Um, you know, they say there's, this, there's three types of people when it comes to, to math, um, those who can count and those who can't. <laughs> but I want to ask, are you good at math? Some yes, some no, some maybe, maybe if you have a calculator. I want to show you someone, does anyone know who this is? Yeah, this guy was, this guy was actually really, really, really good at math. In fact, there's something named after him, the Fibonacci sequence. This is, this is Fibonacci, and he was a mathematician in the 1200s. And uh, people loved coming to him with problems. They wanted him to solve these problems they had. And, and he was a very thoughtful thinker. And someone came to him and he, he, he pondered these questions. And they asked him how many rabbits could be reproduced in, in the perfect environment. And so they said, imagine you have a pair of rabbits, one male, one female. How many rabbits will they produce in a year? And he made the following assumptions. No rabbits die or are eaten by predators. Each female produces every month, starting from the second month she is alive. And every time the female reproduces, she gives birth to one pair of rabbits, one, one male, one female. And so he pondered this question. And this is actually what developed this Fibonacci sequence. And he came to this. After one year, there would be 144 rabbits. Doesn't seem like a whole lot. 144, good amount. But after two years, we go from 144 to 46,308. That's a massive jump. But then from year two to year three, you're hitting 14 million. That's a big number. That's a lot of rabbits. And you might be wondering, why are we talking about math at church? Why are we talking about rabbits at church? And I, I open with this because as followers of Jesus... We are called to produce other disciples. We are called to go and make disciples, pour our lives into others, to make them followers as well. To see, imagine if we saw numbers half as good as this, or a quarter as good as this. The Great Commission that we refer to in, in Matthew 28, 
It's the big dream that we're all called to, to go and make disciples, to go and produce disciples, to go and pour into the lives of others. We are called to produce other disciples. If you don't know the text of Matthew, this is how it goes. Therefore, go and make disciples of not some people, not the people we like, but but disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My question is, do do we actually live this out? Do we live this out in our own life? Because making disciples, producing disciples, it's not just the pastor's job. It's not just the elder's job. It's, it's a job for all of us to go and reproduce in the lives of others, to see Christ lived out in the lives of others. And I shared this statistic yesterday. And I want to share it again today. Does anyone know or does anyone remember from yesterday? How long has the Adventist church been active in Australia? Hey, we remembered over here. Yeah, we've been active for about 136 years in Australia. Do you know how many members we have? Uh, Yeah, about 60, 61,000. So in that time, we've only produced 61,000 members. If we put that into the size of our population, 0.24% of the population. Sort of seems like we aren't growing. Sort of seems like we aren't capturing people. Why not? What's going on? And so that's what I sort of want to dive into today and what we can do as, as followers of Jesus. How we can help share it generation to generation. How we can pass on the faith as a community. Now, I like to have fun and I like to hear people calling out. So I'm going to put up um, some films on the screen. You should, I, I think you'll know these films, maybe not, but yeah, feel free to shout it out, you don't have to put hands up. So, what have we got? Ah, oh. oh, perfect, nice and loud, yes. No, not Harry Potter. The Lord of the Rings, perfect, all right. Rocky. Uh, top, did anyone see the new one? Yes. Yeah? Is it okay if I give spoilers, like, later? Maybe? No? No, no spoilers? Ant-Man. Giant Man. Giant Man. Yeah, yeah, but Ant-Man. Here's the deal. A lot of those were superhero movies. We love superheroes. I love superheroes. Look at the, the box office, the, the top ten films. Large chunk of them. Superhero films. Look at Marvel. What have they done over the past 14 years? Created films that we love, films that we resonate with. We grow up admiring superheroes. We love superheroes. They do good. They stand up for justice. We want to be like them at times. But what I find interesting in a lot of these films, in in a lot of films that we watch, not only the superhero films, but in all films, is that the hero, the hero, the one that we admire, the one that we look up to, the hero themselves needs someone to help them out, someone to mentor them, someone to grow them, to challenge them, and to push them and guide them. In all the films that we see, in the Star Wars films, Luke Skywalker needs Obi-Wan Kenobi to guide him, he needs Yoda to help him become that Jedi. In the Spider-Man films, we see that it's, that it's Iron Man. In the Rocky series, he needs Mickey Goldmill. Ant-Man himself needed, needed Hank. They needed a mentor, a guide, someone who could help them become the hero they were ought to be. And so I got this idea that says heroes are made, not born. For every hero we see, there is a hero maker. There was a guy who who did his whole thesis on this whole idea and on storytelling and the idea in movies. He said, in most movies we see, the hero is ill-equipped for all that lies ahead, but meets a mentor or a helper who offers wisdom, tools, or the courage to journey on. The hero makes allies and enemies and maybe even falls in love. Joseph Campbell was his name. He popularized the common journey of every hero 
and summarized it into 12 stages. He said that in stage four, the hero always meets a mentor. And the mentor gives the hero the guidance and the tools to leave the ordinary and move into the extraordinary. And in a sense, the mentor is a hero maker. And that's my premise that I want to get at today, that we're not necessarily called to be the hero as much as we want to be. In church, we're called to be the hero maker. Who are we pouring into? Who are we raising up? Who are we helping along in the journey? Who are we making a hero out of? And I want us all to reflect for a moment because we've all had people that have poured into us, people who have shaped us and helped us become who we are today. Each and every one of us, we've had parents, mom, dad, who have sacrificed a lot just to raise us. We've had teachers that we can reflect on and who have helped us. They were the ones who put into us. We have coaches. We have pastors. We have pathfinder leaders. We have people who have poured into us. See, we are all the result of someone who has spent time with us, invested in us, taught us, coached us, put into us. Think for a moment, who are some of the people that have poured into your life? What did they do? What was it about them and how did they make you feel? And you might have seen that I was um, putting out some pieces of paper before and if you've got a piece of paper on your pew, it should look like this. I want you to pull it up. Uh, It should be on the side of some of the pews here. If you don't have one, I think Jess printed some more. Grab that, grab a pencil or a pen. And it's sort of, there should be, it's sort of like a funnel. And there should be a blank spot at the bottom. There's two sides to this. We're going to focus on one side at the bottom moment. But I want you to write your name down the bottom here. That's you. And then up the top, I want you to reflect. I want you to think about who are all the people in your life who have shaped you? Who are all the people in your life that have influenced you? Who are the people that have invested in you and helped you become who you are today? Mum, dad, pastor, pathfinder leaders. Who's been a mentor? Who's been someone who has spent time with you? Maybe it's one person. Maybe it's multiple people. Write them down. We've all had people in our life who have helped us become who we are today. Who's helped us become us? Who's poured into us? I know I share people who have poured into my life. And one of the people, one of the biggest persons who have poured into my life is actually in this room right now. And he's he's walking around with his his daughter at the moment. (laughs) But here's a photo. This is a throwback. We we talked about my baptism last night, but that's, that's me there. Does anyone know the person there that's baptizing me there? Josh's mom, what's her name? Faye, Faye yeah. These are two, Josh and Faye are two people who have poured into my life, who have helped me become who I am today. They were hero makers for me. See, I never wanted to be a pastor. That's often the case. Not a lot of pastors want to actually be pastors. It's not uh, the, the, what we wake up with in the morning. I remember, in fact, I remember being in a, in a, in a class in, in high school, and it was maybe a Bible class, and I was, I don't know, I was reflecting for a moment, and I said, man, if there's one thing I don't want to do, it's, it's be a pastor. I think that job would suck, but um, here we are today. But it was also something that you wouldn't expect me to do either. See, I was a quiet, shy, timid kid. I didn't enjoy, I was definitely afraid of speaking up the front. I was the last person you would expect to be up the front. Those class assignments where you would have to share up the front, I took sick days, I avoided those, I didn't want to do it. And I remember that in year nine, there was this leadership program that ran during the school holidays and and schools got got to send one person. And I remember Faye sent me when I was in year nine. And people asked her, and I've asked her, why did you send me? I, 
I didn't see myself as a leader. The teachers at school didn't see me as a leader. But Faye had this deep sense, this deep call from God that you need to send him there. That there's something there. And, and Faye saw something within me that I didn't see myself. And she spent countless times with me over the years, just pouring into me, shaping me, molding me, helping me to see what God was doing in my life. And the same with Josh as well. Yeah, we started out trying to play drums. But often those sessions were just us talking, just us hanging out. And over those years, he just kept pouring into me and pouring into me and pouring into me. And it took years, years. And eventually we got to the point where, where Faye and Josh were just saying to me, you've got to be a pastor. You've got ministry in you. And I didn't see it. I didn't sense it. But it was these two constantly pouring into me encouraging me, empowering me. Sometimes they would even throw me in the deep end. But that got me to where I am today. And it wasn't them about being the heroes. It was about them being the hero maker. They, Josh could have easily done half the stuff himself. Faye could have done all this stuff herself. But she knew that it was about empowering the next generation, the next leader. I remember at church, you know, Josh would just get me, okay, go talk about the offering. Okay, I'll go talk about the offering. And then he'd just... Give me some pointers. Give me some tips afterwards. And then I would start preaching and he would give me some pointers and tips on that as well. They poured into me and invested into me. And it didn't happen overnight. It happened over the long haul. So the question is for us, who are we pouring into? See, because it's a good thing to be a hero. A lot of us want to be the hero, the center of attention. But it's an even better thing when you can step back and be the hero maker. Make a hero out of someone else. Help someone else see something they don't see in themselves. And I want to reflect because Jesus, I think, was an amazing hero maker. Yeah, he could have done it all on his own. But instead he called 12 ordinary guys, poured into them, and changed the world with them. And so Jesus did a lot of heroic things. He taught amazing sermons, preached amazing sermons, had a big crowds, did these miracles. But his focus was always on others. So there's a few things about Jesus. First, Jesus intentionally picked people, and we come across this passage in the book of Luke. And it says, One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came... He called his disciples to him, and he chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. See, Jesus had a crowd following him. He had lots of people, but he intentionally picked 12 people, 12 people he could spend his time with, that he could pour into, that he could, that he could pray with, that he could challenge. Jesus' focus was on the few. See, when you think about Jesus' life, and when you think about the ministry of Jesus, how do you picture Jesus spending his time? Do you, do you picture him with the masses, feeding the 5,000, teaching the Sermon on the Mount, doing all these crazy things with the people, or do you picture him with the disciples? See, if we tally up all the events in the Gospels, there's 63 events in total. 46 events... Jesus spent with the 12, and he only spent 17 with the masses. 73% of his time, the large chunk of his time, was focused with the few. Jesus was intentional with his time, pouring into just a few people, a few disciples, because he only had a short time, and he knew that he could do a lot more with a few than with a lot. The crowds were not the focus of Jesus, the 12 were. So for us as a church, for us as believers, what's our focus? Do we prayerfully ask God to put people in our life? Do we ask, do we look for these people that are around us? Who's the people God has put in your life right now? Who's around you? Who can you pour into? There's this quote that hit me hard the other day. I just want to share it with you, and it's on spending our time, and especially spending our time in church. And it says this, 
If Jesus spent eight hours a day, every day, for three years with his disciples, he would have spent over 8,000 hours with them. After all the time, they still had major gaps. One hour a week at church will never change people. We need a life that abides in him with the support of others. So often we just come to church one hour a week and expecting change from that. But change doesn't happen one hour a week. It happens over a lifetime. How are we spending our life with people? How are we pouring into people? How are we pouring into the people in our church? See, to accomplish the mission, Jesus had to empower others. He needed to make them better. So he intentionally and prayerfully picked people. The second thing Jesus did is that he shared his life with people. He shared his life with the 12. I want to read a simple passage here coming from the book of John. It says, Then Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem and went to the Judean countryside. Jesus spent some time with them there, baptizing people. It's a really simple verse. But I love that Jesus spent time with them. Jesus was intentional with his time. And there's this, there's this Greek word in this passage that I love. We're going to say a Greek word together. Diatribo. Can you say diatribo? Yeah. Diatribo. And this word, this spending time with, it carries the connotation of rubbing off. So the, the person next to you, can you rub shoulders with? Rub shoulders. You're rubbing off on them. <laughs> and have you ever spent so much time with somebody that you start to pick up their mannerisms, that you start to pick up their language, or maybe they start to pick up your language, and they start to use your phrases, they start to use your way of doing things. Essentially, that's, that's the premise behind this word. See, Jesus was spending time with his disciples. He wanted the disciples to become like him. He wanted to be a good influence to rub off on them. You become like those you associate with. So who do you associate with? What sort of influence are you? How are you influencing the people around you? Being a hero maker is a great way to live because it allows you to leave a legacy beyond yourself because it's not about you. It's about those around you. It's about the next generation. There's an interesting line that Jesus leaves us. It comes from the Gospel of John again. Now, I'm always, it's always hard to understand this one. Because he says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than me because I'm going to the Father. Jesus tells us we're going to do greater things than him. It's a really hard thing to... How can we do greater things than Jesus? Imagine Michael Jordan coming to you, handing you a basketball, telling you you're going to be better than me. We'd laugh. It doesn't make sense. Or imagine Bob Ross handing you a paintbrush. You're going to paint more beautiful mountains than me. It does not make a lot of sense. How is that possible? Yet Jesus says these very words to his disciples and to us, and we're like, oh, is Jesus being hyperbolic here? Is it an exaggeration? What is Jesus getting at? But if we think about it, it's, it's true because the gospel went all over the world. It started with 12, reached millions. In fact, billions. There's now over 2, people, 2 billion people who call themselves Christians, call themselves Christ followers. It went from 12 to 2 billion. The Bible's translated into multiple languages. We've been able to do great things as people who follow God. But the disciples, Jesus knew, the disciples knew that they needed to keep passing it on, to keep raising up others. See, we see the disciples, but then we see the disciples call more people. Pour into more people. Pour into the, the next generation. And as a church, are we pouring in to the next generation? And again, I want to reflect on those words in Matthew 28 where it says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you. It's the end of the age. 
Jesus gives us this grand dream here. It's a dream that extends to every generation. It's a call to every generation to continually pass it on to the people before us, to the generation in front of us. I've always heard it said that we're only one generation away from losing the gospel. So what are we doing to pass it on? How are we pouring into? Where's our focus? Remember that stat from before, we only make up 0.25% of the population. Imagine if we just aimed for 1%. That's 250,000 people who would call themselves Adventists in Australia. Amazing. And we can do that if we learn to become hero makers. Because it's not about one heroic effort. It's not about the once-off. It's something that goes every single day. So imagine if Faye or Josh just did a once-off with me. I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be in ministry. But they keep pouring into me day after day, week after week. It's something that keeps on going. When we were at college church, Nimrod, the senior pastor, said this, said this phrase that was hard to swallow. He said, the baptism doesn't count until the person you baptize baptizes someone else. Wow, yeah. The baptism doesn't count until that person baptizes someone else because it's something that keeps going. It's something that we need to produce in the lives of other people. And it begins to make you think differently because not only is it about getting the person in the font, but it's living the life afterwards. When we look back at the life of Jesus, he was a hero maker. Hero makers take the initiative. They look for the people around. They prayerfully ask God to put people in their life, inviting them in, giving them opportunity. They see something that no one else sees. So I want you to reflect. Who's God placed in your life? Who's around you? Hero makers regularly pour into people. The disciples, they weren't anything special. They were, they were tradesmen, ordinary guys. Yet Jesus chose them. Jesus poured into them. Jesus raised them up. And they, were, they, they grew, they learned, and they went and shared the gospel all around the known world at the time. So who are you passing it on to? Who's the people around you? This can be one of the most rewarding yet challenging things that we do in life. Because after all, Jesus still had Judas in his group. He was betrayed. He was hurt. Yet he was rewarded with the disciples, the other disciples. Hero making is something that takes time, energy, and effort. After all the time Jesus spent with them, the disciples weren't even perfect. They still had flaws. It's something that keeps going. And it doesn't have to be something massive. It doesn't have to be something about being up the front. What opportunities are around you? Who's God put into your life? And I love this quote from Andy Stanley. He says this, the greatest contribution you might make to the kingdom isn't something you do, but somebody you raise. The greatest contribution you might make might not be something you do, but somebody you raise. Who's God put into your life? I always love sports, and uh, this lady, her name is Shalay Flanagan, and she is one of the greatest female runners in America. She's been running for a very long time now, and she's won the silver medal in the 10,000 meters at the 2008 Olympics, and in 2017, she won the New York City Marathon, and it was the first time an American female had won it in a long time. And she did it, and get this, she ran a marathon in two hours and 26 minutes. Incredible. Her victory, though, was more than just an athletic achievement. And you can read about her story online. Perhaps the biggest accomplishment is her nurturing and raising the talent around her. Because not only was she focused on herself, but she was focused on how can I make 
people around me? How can I make the other runners better as well? And they call it the Shla... I can't even pronounce her name properly. But they name an effect after her. See, every single one of her training partners, 11 women in total, have all made it to the Olympics while training with her. Prior to her, they only had one female go to the Olympics in running, in long distance running. But ever since she's become a part of the team, all, the, all people who train with her went to the Olympics as well. What an amazing effect. In a sport that often focuses on the self, she took the focus of self and looked at those around her. She's become known as the team mum. She's someone I call a hero maker. See, there was this girl that joined. Her name was Emily Infield. She joined after college but developed a stress, one stress fracture after another. And in 2014, she contemplated quitting. But Flanagan came aside her, had a meal, had a talk. Infield said, I was really struggling. I cried and told her, I can't do it. My body isn't built for this. But she totally changed my mindset. She told me that, of course, this was bad, but she believed I could do better. I got better. We trained together, and she held me accountable. It's completely changed my career. By the following August, Infield had become one of the fastest runners in the world, taking a surprise bronze in the 10,000 meters at the World Championship. She constantly inspires others. She's raised a whole generation of female talent who are now inspired to be runners as well. And I think she captures what it means to be a hero maker. In church, the people around us, who can we pour into? Because being a hero is good, but it's even better when you can become a hero maker. So has everyone still got that piece of paper from before? If you flip it around, I now want you to put your name at the top. Your name's going to be at the top, and then I want you to, to think for a moment. Who are the people in your life that you can pour into? Maybe it's one. Maybe it's one person you can think of. Maybe it's a teen you can think of. Maybe it's a child you can think of. Maybe, maybe it's someone, somewhere, who needs you to pour into them, to take notice of them. Who are you going to pour into? Who can you speak life into? Who can you encourage? Who can you inspire? Who can you help reach their God-given potential? Because something, this is something we all need to do as a church, as a community of believers, young and old. We need to be thinking about who can we share our life with? Who can we pour into? Who has God put into our life? This is something that is so important to us. And I want to share with you something. This is a, something that the, the GC put together in 2020. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe you haven't. But they've collected data. I think this is since the, over the last 55 years. The Adventist Church as a whole. We've had over 40 million people join the church. Awesome. It's great. But we've also had 16 million leave. Almost half left the church. A staggering amount of people have walked out of our doors. A lot of those being young people. You might have heard of this guy, Alan Martin. He does a lot with growing young and he does a lot with, with youth in the Adventist church. And he stared, shared a startling figure. He shared that 60 to 70% of youth are actually leaving the church. He added that not having a significant relationship with another adult makes young adults two times as likely to drop out of church. What can we do as a church to stop that? We can build relationships. We can be hero makers. We can look at taking the focus off ourselves and looking at the needs of the next generation. Seeing what God wants to do in their life. Helping them to see their own God-given potential and giving them the space to do it as well. So I want to leave you with this thought. Don't be a hero. 
Don't be the center of attention, but instead, be the hero maker. Help someone else see their God-given potential and their God-given calling. Who can you pour into? our final songs for this service I urge you to reflect on the greatest hero maker of all time our Christ Jesus so please stand with us and sing turn your eyes upon Jesus so much and what a great reminder to turn our eyes on Jesus and I was reflecting as as Josh was sharing such a great message thank you for that um, you know to turn our eyes upon Jesus sometimes we think it's it's just turning our eyes to the heavens which it, it, it is but I was also reflecting maybe we also need to turn, turn our eyes upon how Jesus is working around us and how Jesus is working in that next generation coming through um, where Jesus is moving, how we can be praying into that, how we can be speaking into that, moving into that. And I love this this next song, Hosanna, that chorus, Hosanna, which is just a word for adoration, joy, and praise. And we give God, we give Jesus our highest adoration our pr- and praise and joy. He is our highest Hosanna. But there is this verse in this next song that says that I see a generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith. What a Hosanna that is, that Jesus has not only worked in the past, that Jesus has not only worked in my life, but He's continuing to work in these young people coming through this generation, rising up to take their place. So let's declare this Hosanna this morning as our final song as we sing. Let's declare the praises of our Lord. Let's lift up His name and let's look for that generation rising up to take their place, to sow in and to celebrate what God is doing through them. Amen. Let's sing.
Hosanna. Lord, we, are, we thank you for today, and I thank you that we can come here and gather. We can worship, we can pray, and we can dig into your word. And I just want to pray over this community, that they can become hero makers like you, that we can turn our eyes not only upon you, but the generation before us, and help us to pour into them and give them a place where they can find you as well and live out their God-given calling. I pray that we leave here differently to how we walked in because we encountered you today. I pray that you work through each and every one of us, put people in our life that we can pour into. I leave it all in your hands. And everybody said, Amen.